Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I'm Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Coming to you from Washington's premier indoor shooting facility. Of course, that's Security Gun Club right here in Woodenville, Washington. Listen, we got huge, huge news as it relates to forced reset triggers and wide open triggers. Now, we spent a lot of time a little more than a year ago talking about this topic way, way too much. And I did get to meet a lot of you around the country because of this issue. But it appears that our good friends over at the National Association for Gun Rights, well, they have scored a massive victory. And when I mean massive, I mean that this rule determination, the determination that forced reset triggers and wide open triggers standing alone constitute machine guns, well, it is officially dead. So let's go through the ruling. Let's geek out so that you guys could better understand. So today, let's spend a few minutes and talk about how ATF's trigger rule just got crushed. Okay, America, this is what we're talking about today. We're talking about the case of National Association for Gun Rights v. Garland. It is a case that is filed in the United States District Court for the Northern District of Texas. NAGR had previously obtained preliminary injunctive relief for some individuals and they have now won this suit outright through summary judgment. A big, big win, which means, of course, hey, even if it was a terrible loss, they're in the trenches fighting like hell for you. So we're going to put a link down below for the good folks over at the National Association for Gun Rights and the Dudley Brown, their president over there. Show them some love if you can. Now, you guys will all recall that even though the ATF had no problem with force reset triggers and wide open triggers for a long period of time, suddenly one day they did a 180 and suddenly they decided, hey, these standing alone constitute unlawful machine guns. The court, if you wanted to really summarize how the court viewed ATF's actions was as follows. Having considered the above reference filings and applicable law, the court concludes that defendants engaged in unlawful agency action taken in excess of their authority. The court grants plaintiff's motion for summary judgment and denies the defendant's cross motion for summary judgment. Now, let us remember that this just wasn't a turnabout in rulemaking. No, this had a lot of consequences for a lot of people. The people who owned force reset trigger, the people who owned wide open trigger, well, basically they were run out of business. They were basically turned insolvent. And then many of you were threatened with criminal prosecution, some of which I got the pleasure of working with. So this wasn't just some willy nilly, let's make up a new rule. No, this is a new rule that came out of nowhere, but had a lot of teeth to it. And one that the ATF was more than willing to enforce and was gonna make several people's lives miserable in doing so. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, what the National Association for Gun Rights has done here is they have won a summary judgment. A summary judgment is basically an argument where one side says to the court, hey, listen, there really is no dispute about the facts. There really is no dispute about what the law is. And because of that, when you take a look at what the facts and the law are, we win automatically go ahead and grant us judgment. Or as the court put it, a court shall grant summary judgment if the movement shows that there is no genuine dispute as to any material fact and the movement is entitled to judgment as a matter of law. Now, summary judgments get filed in a lot of cases, but rarely, I do mean rarely, get granted. So not only was this a big victory for NAGR and gun owners nationwide, this was a resounding defeat of the ATF as well. Now, as I mentioned, there was desperation from the Department of Justice the minute this suit was filed. And even they tried to file for their own summary judgment, which, as you now know from the pleadings, that was denied. Of course, they also tried the great escape hatch, which is, hey, none of these people have standing. And they went one further because they made four separate challenges saying that if any one of these is lacking, this suit should be thrown out. And they had the audacity to argue that there was no one individual standing two associational standing three conduct beyond possession standing and four pre-enforcement challenges and the court unfortunately had to waste several pages of this opinion dealing with all of these ludicrous standing arguments which were all summarily shot down but once again was it the second amendment that saved the day and helped nagr obtain this victory not at all no as a matter of fact the second amendment's not cited really hardly anywhere in this opinion no once again it was the Administrative Procedure Act, a piece of legislation passed in 1946. The ATF clearly acted outside their statutory scope in promulgating new rules to redefine statutes without an act of Congress. And so the court has found, among other procedural requirements, the APA requires agencies to provide legislative rules for public notice and comment. 
and to ensure that the final version of such rule is a logical outgrowth of the agency's initial regulatory proposal. The APA's arbitrary and capricious standard requires that the agency action be both reasonable and reasonably explained. This means that agencies must not rely on factors which Congress has not intended it to consider or entirely fail to consider an important aspect of the problem when issuing regulations. And of course, that led to this particular argument which the court has ruled is correct. Plaintiffs contend that the ATF's broadened view of the machine gun definition as applied to FRTs is an unlawful expansion of the agency's authority. Plaintiffs are correct. Because there is no genuine dispute regarding material facts and statutory interpretation is a question of law, the court concludes that the ATF exceeded its statutory authority by expanding definition of machine gun and subsequently classifying FRTs as machine guns. Now, in again, the stark desperation that was being demonstrated here by the Department of Justice, and they actually tried to argue that even though both sides had been allowed to call experts and had testified, that really all of that evidence should be disregarded and the court should actually rely on the lower administrative record. They literally had the audacity to say, we want you to ignore some evidence because that will help you rule in our favor. I'm not making it up. And as the court has now found, defendants argue that the court should decline to consider materials outside the administrative record, including those presented at the preliminary injunction hearing in support of the merits of the plaintiff's claim. Plaintiffs respond that limiting review in this way is inappropriate for a variety of responses. One of those reasons is that at least one exception to the general record requirement applies given the nature of the claims presented and the fact that plaintiffs, along with the entire public at large, played no role whatsoever in producing or contributing to the administrative record. The court agrees with plaintiffs. But I want you to know that it was even more nefarious than that because much like how they are still trying to inject a two-part balancing test into Second Amendment equations, yeah, they're also still trying to revive the Chevron doctrine, even though that has completely been put out to pasture by the Supreme Court. And what the United States District Court observed here was, on closer examination, defendants' record rule arguments are a little more than a thinly veiled backdoor effort to import Chevron-style deference into this case. True, defendants have never claimed that Chevron deference applies in this case directly, but by limiting review to the administrative record, the functional result is the equivalent of Chevron deference. Okay, now some of you may recall we did this video right here where I was like, hey, listen, uh, the United States Department of Justice just filed a supplemental brief of authorities and they cherry picked a lot of language out of Cargill and are they possibly reviving some life into this argument? Well, obviously we now know the answer is no, they did not. And so if I was a little alarming on that, I apologize. But as we also know, they made a big difference about the auto sear and a machine gun and the similarities to some of the components in the FRT. The court here obviously was not persuaded by that. They have ruled. As the Supreme Court agreed, a weapon that qualifies as a machine gun under the NFA must be capable of one, firing multiple rounds by a single function of the trigger and two, do so automatically. In other words, the NFA unambiguously defines a machine gun as a weapon that fires automatically once the trigger performs a single function. And the court went on to point out, Cargill underscores that the definition is solely concerned with the mechanical operation of the trigger rather than the actions of the user. As a result, which firearms qualify as machine gun turns entirely on the movement of the trigger itself rather than the trigger finger. And really where the court came down is to say, listen, Cargill's already said that bump stocks do not qualify as machine guns. It doesn't fit within the statutory definition. And if you really want to get kind of overgeneralized about what a force reset trigger or a wide open trigger does, it's a bump trigger. It takes the recoil energy and helps with the cycling of the firearm in a manner that allows a shooter to be quicker than they normally would. But the trigger has to function each and every time a round is discharged down that barrel. As the court pointed out here, by harnessing the firearm's natural recoil to quickly re-engage the trigger, a skilled shooter utilizing this bump firing technique can rapidly fire multiple rounds. Yet despite this increase in firing speed, Cargill determined that bump stocks are not machine guns because the device does not meet both elements of the statutory definition. 
one, capable of firing multiple rounds by a single function of the trigger, and two, operating automatically. As the Supreme Court statutory interpretation makes clear, a single function of the trigger means what it says, a single function of the trigger. It does not mean a single pull by the shooter or some analogous motion. The court went on to further explain itself as, function and pull are not synonymous. The former is based on a mechanical perspective, whereas the latter is based on the shooter's perspective. And as much as the Department of Justice said, hey, Cargill really supports our position, the court found that actually Cargill discredited just about everything that the Department of Justice had argued. Applying the guidance from both Cargill decisions here, FRTs do not fire multiple rounds with a single function of the trigger and thus do not qualify as machine guns. For each and every round fired, the trigger moves forward into its reset state and is depressed to release the hammer from its sear surface. Because the operative mechanical function of the trigger is to release the hammer, that the trigger of an FRT equipped firearm functions for each shot fired disqualifies it as a machine gun under the current statutory definition. Cargill leaves no doubt that this required action is in relation to the function of the trigger itself, which is defined purely mechanically under the statute rather than an action taken by the user. And again, in response to this argument that DOJ had proffered, which is, hey, basically the FRT is no different than an auto sear, which you see in fully automatic weapons, the court kind of scoffed at it as follows. Similar to the government in Cargill, the defendants here cannot overcome the plain reading of the statutory language. When the ATF revised its interpretation of machine gun to define a single function of the trigger as the same thing as a single pull of the trigger and analogous motion, its definition conflicted with the definition provided by the controlling statutes. Okay, and then finally we gotta get to remedies because hey, it's not a win unless there's a remedy, right? What has the court done? Well, in general, the court has issued the remedy of vacator, which is essentially, we're gonna take this rule, we're gonna crumble it up, we're gonna throw it in the waste paper basket and we're gonna act like it never ever happened. This rule, for all intents purposes, is dead as of now. Specifically, the court in its order has issued the following as remedies. Therefore, in keeping with these obligations, the court tailors the scope of injunction with careful attention to completely redress the violations established and to also avoid upsetting competing interests. Thus, the court enjoins defendant from the following actions against any person or entity. Okay, this rule is enjoined to anybody. So this is well outside the name plaintiffs that had gotten preliminary injunctive relief. This is anybody who's living, breathing right now. The court has enjoined the following. A, initiating or pursuing criminal prosecutions for possession of FRTs. B, initiating or pursuing civil proceedings for possessing, selling, or manufacturing FRTs based on the claim that FRTs are machine guns. C, initiating or pursuing criminal prosecutions for representing to the public of potential buyers and sellers that FRTs are not machine guns. D, sending notice letters or other similar communities stating that FRTs are machine guns. E, requesting voluntary surrender of FRTs to the government based on the claim that FRTs are machine guns. Pay attention to that. That was all of Operation Reticent Recall. If you're receiving any nasty letters from the ATF now stating that, hey, listen, you got an FRT and we think you have a machine gun, you can crumble them up and throw them away. There's a couple more activities that have been enjoined. F, destroying any previously surrendered or seized FRTs. Ooh, I know some of you destroyed your own, but some of you may have actually turned them in and you may be entitled to receive that property back. And finally, G, otherwise interfering in the possession, sale, manufacture, transfer, exchange of FRTs based on the claim that FRTs are machine guns. Now that last one, don't get too excited and think you're gonna be able to run out to your gun store and start buying FRTs and wide open triggers. And remember, you may have state law that actually defines machine guns based upon rate of fire, so you may still be screwed on this thing anyways. Nonetheless, once again, the ATF has absolutely had their ass handed to them. There is not a single rulemaking order that they have promulgated under President Biden that has not been either paused or killed in the time that he's been in office. The case, once again, is National Association for Gun Rights v. Garland. We're gonna go ahead and link it up down below so that you guys can geek out on it for yourself. Kudos to everyone and all the attorneys over there at the National Association for Gun Rights. This is a fantastic win. If you guys got questions about this or anything else related to what's left of our Second Amendment rights, you should know how to get a hold of Washington Gun Law by now. If you don't, that's okay. 
That information is down there in the description box. Maybe you got an idea for a video. If you do, go ahead and click on that link right there. Or maybe you just want to be part of our monthly newsletter. If you do, we got a link down below in the description box. Click there, get subscribed. And then finally, and most importantly, let's everyone remember that part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here, is to know what the law is in every situation, how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching. Stay safe.